There's another row right where Hannah Evans is. Yep, good man. Uh, that's it. Keep on filling up. Um, uh, yeah, please do fill up. There's lots of seats over here. Uh, please don't just sit over there. Come on through. Uh, that'll be great. Um, a warm welcome. My name's Jack. I'm one of the, the church family here uh, at Broadmead. Um, and uh, I'm going to be leading us through our service uh, together. Um, you, you might be new to church, a particular warm welcome if you are. Um, what we're going to be doing in the next sort of hour and a quarter or so is we're going to be um, singing together. We're going to be hearing from God's word together. Uh, and we're going to be praying together uh, as well as a church family. Um, but before we kind of dive into that, there's a few bits of church news for you as well. There's lots of notices on the screen, so please do pay attention to that. But Hannah and Sarah uh, have two notices. So Hannah, if you want to go first, and Sarah, if you follow, that would be great. Hello. Is this on? Yeah, great. Good morning, everyone. So lovely to... Um, see you all. I have um, two notices um, this morning. Um, firstly, um, very exciting news, um, the booking forms for the church weekend away are now open, um, so you can start um, booking for that. Um, the weekend is from the 10th to the 12th of May um, in Hebron Hall, which is in Cardiff, not very far away at all. Um, and there's an option on the form if you need a lift um, to put down that you would like a lift. Um, so don't worry about, um, yeah, trying to get there. There'll be options um, for that. Um, if you book before the 31st of December, um, you can get the early bird price. Um, otherwise, booking um, is open until the 31st of um, January. Um, and if you scan um, the barcode that's on the screen, you'll be taken um, to all the information about um, prices and, um, yeah, uh, yeah, banking information and all of that. Um, it would be so lovely to have as many of you as possible um, come and join us. Um, there'll be lots of times for um, fun and games and time as a family together. And we'll be hearing from um, God's word throughout the weekend and worshipping him together. So it'll be a lovely time of extended um, worship and time as a family. So yeah, do um, get booking that. Um, and then one more thing. Um, we have our evangelistic service um, next week. Um, is there anything um, to hope for? Um, this will be really a um, great opportunity to be inv inviting um, your friends, your colleagues, um, and um, having them come along and hearing about the hope that Jesus offers us, um, the hope that uh, many of us in this room um, have experienced and know, and um, yeah, know all that he can give us. Um, so there are flyers on the piano and then at the back. Um, do grab those and be um, yeah, giving them to your friends. Um, the talk will be um, evangelistic, it will be um, shorter than last time, and um, there will be, yeah, hopefully an, uh, a story from someone who's experienced the hope that um, Jesus um, gives them. And we're also going to be meeting today after the service, um, just over by the piano, um, and we'll be praying together, and then we'll be going out and handing out flyers around Broadmead. Um, so do join us for that as well. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Um, for those of you who have been to our Christmas wreath making um, afternoon, you'll be delighted to know that it's back again this year and the cards to sign up are on the table at the back. This is not your ticket. This is a card that you pick up. There's a QR code on the back. There's a small charge. It's on Saturday, the 25th of November, three till six. What is a Christmas wreath if you don't know? It looks a little bit like that picture. It's a Christmas decoration that you can hang up in your house or on your door. It's made of fresh holly and leaves and very pretty things, so you're very welcome to come along. Um, you can bring friends, but it's first come, first served, so I'd encourage you to go and get a card. We'd love to see you there and um, sign up on the QR. Thank you. Thanks both. Um, one other notice uh, to put in your diary is next week it's Remembrance Sunday, and so we're going to be kicking off things here at 10 to 11, um, the kind of typical broad me time. Please, please don't take that as 11 o'clock. We will be kicking off at 10 to 11 because we'll be holding a, a two-minute silence um, or a minute silence at 11 o'clock. So please don't turn up at 11. Um, good stuff. So as, as we come to our, our time of worship this morning, um, I'm aware we, we probably have had a variety of weeks, a variety of mornings maybe as we've, as we've come to church. But let me just read us as Psalm 100 as we turn our hearts to to think about praising God, 
uh, as we turn our minds to him. Let, let me read that for us. Psalm 100, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What's amazing is, is that psalm points us to the, the character of God, to what God has done, to who he is, uh, and what we should do as response to that. We should praise him. And, and we're going to focus in on, on, on God's faithfulness, on his goodness, as we sing these next three songs. We're going to be singing uh, Man of Sorrows, uh, which talks about um, Jesus' triumphant uh, rising from the dead. We're going to be singing uh, This I Believe, which talks uh, again about who God is, his faithfulness to us, uh, and then the final song, Yes and Amen, as we've been journeying through Genesis um, as a church, we've been thinking about God's faithfulness and his promises that he keeps uh, and ultimately fulfills in Jesus. And so we're going to sing that as well as we head then into to hear John uh, preach to us. Uh, so why don't we stand? I'm going to pray for us uh, and then we're going to sing and worship God together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that just despite uh, our, our weeks and, and maybe what's happening in our lives, Lord, that you remain good. Lord, you are a good father. Lord, you are a faithful king. Father, and, and we thank you that we can stand here uh, and we can be assured that we are your children because you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. Father, we pray that this morning we would meet with you. Lord, you would be here uh, by your spirit, Lord, you would be speaking to us, you'd be ministering to us, and Lord, we would just, uh, yeah, be able to just put aside the distractions of our weeks, or the distractions of the day to come, and Lord, we would focus in uh, on you and your love for us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessing together. A man of sorrows, lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' land. As he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. And all that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor to thee saints of heaven god's own son to pray and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree and all that rugged cross my salvation when your love poured out over paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin, it has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free 
Oh, it's free and see. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, it's free. God be praised. It 
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. darkness you have filled me with peace giver of mercy you're my help in time Lord I can't help but sing faithful you are faithful You have broken every curse Blessed Redeemer You have set this captive free Lord, I can't help but sing Sing faithful Faithful you are Faithful Oh, your promises. 
promises are yes and amen. Sing all your promises. And all your promises are yes and amen. And all your promises are yes and amen. And yeah, we thank you so much for that. Lord, your promises are yes and amen. And they are yes and amen in Jesus. Father, we, we thank you so much that we can stand here and know that you are a faithful God. Lord, you are a God who, who keeps to his promises. Lord, you are a God who sent Jesus to die for us. Lord, to, to bring us back to you. Lord, to deal with our sin, to deal with our rejection and rebellion against you. Father, and we, we stand here as your children. And we can confidently approach you, Lord, because of what Jesus has done for us. So, Lord, might that just dwell in us richly now as we uh, hear from your word together uh, and as we, uh, yeah, just open our hearts to what you're going to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good stuff. The, uh, the kids and the young people are going to head out to their groups now. So if you've got a, a child under the age of 14, um, do head on, follow the masses. Um, don't know if parents have to still go with them, looking for... They do, yes, your parents, please do go with them uh, through the hall, I think it is, um, as they go to their groups as well, if that's okay, just to make sure that they don't hurt themselves. While they're going out, why don't we turn to the person around us, maybe someone we've not spoken to uh, yet, maybe just uh, say a quick hello, uh, and why don't we just, yeah, tell them the best part of your week that you've had so far. Good stuff. Oh, different mic. Um, why don't you draw, draw those conversations to a close, uh, but, but do keep them going after the service. Um, you know, do, uh, do find out what that cool thing that that person did uh, this week over, over one of the remaining croissants, if you can fight for it. Um, those of you who, who've been here over the last couple of weeks um, will know that we're, we're reading the Bible together as a, as a church over the next two years. So if you're, if you're new to us uh, here at Broadmead this morning, um, we're kind of taking a journey through all the books of the Bible, uh, starting with Genesis, finishing with Revelation, um, over the next two years. We started about four or five weeks ago. And, and we're doing this because the Bible, we believe, is, is the living word of God. And as we, as we read it, we get to know Jesus more, uh, and we can fall in love with him more as well, and we're, we're transformed uh, into his likeness, the Bible says. And so as I say, we're, we're reading um, a chapter of the Old Testament and a chapter of the New Testament every day, so we've been doing that for the last month. And um, there's no pressure, if you're new to church, to, to join in and maybe catch up for the last month or so. Um, but we are kind of seeing that pattern through daily in our kind of devotionals, but also on a Sunday here at church uh, and also uh, in our home groups as well. Um, and so this uh, coming week, um, we're going to be kind of carrying on in Mark. We're going to see Jesus as he heads towards Jerusalem and a little bit of his trial as well um, when he's taken uh, by the Romans and the chief priests. And we're also going to carry on our uh, time in Genesis as well um, as we read and see the story of Joseph, which actually John is going to be preaching on. Uh, today. Um, and just as a regular pattern for that, just so we can read the Bible together, um, on a Sunday we read one of those passages together as well, just to kind of keep that uh, as a habit for us. Um, and so Liz is going to come, I think, and read Mark chapter 8. Is that right? Yeah? Now's your time. <laughs> Good stuff. So if you, uh, Mark 8, maybe on the screen, uh, if not, Liz is going to read it for us. Hear me? Okay. Um, 
you. So I'm just going to go ahead and start reading it. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have comp compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I've sent them home hungry, they will collapse on their way. Because some of them have come a very come a long distance. His disciple answered, But where is this remote place? Can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and gave thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. When they had a few small fishes as well, he gave thanks to them and also told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of, full of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he, gave, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Damantius. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for signs? Truly I tell you, no signs will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for the one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of pieces did they pick, pick up? 12, they replied. Then when I broke the seven loaves and the, and sorry, and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basket pieces did you pick up? They said seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida and some of the people, um, some of the people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spat in the, in the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. One, one more, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open. His sight was restored and he saw everything. Clearly, Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the villages. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippa. On the way, he asked them, Why do, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He, said. he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the minds in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called a crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their lives will lose it, but whoever loses their lives, but whoever loses their lives, um, sorry, give me one second. Whoever, but for whoever wants to save their lives will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them 
when he came in his father's glory with the holy angels. Liz, thank you so much. That's a long chapter. Thank you for reading that for us. Um, great, we're going to uh, come to a time of prayer now. Isaac's going to come up and lead us in that. Uh, and after Isaac's done that, Kez is going to come and read our, uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. And then John is going to come up uh, and preach for us. Cool. <clears throat> Let's pray now. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that, yeah, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed king. You are the one who the Old Testament scriptures spoke of. You are the one who came to save his people, who came to rescue. Um, Lord, thank you that, Jesus, you came and you were the son of man and you came to suffer many things, to be rejected. That Jesus had to die. But Jesus, you rose again after three days. Lord, help us to recognize that this is your gospel. This is what you call us to lose your, our lives for. Lord, we cannot save our own lives. We need Jesus, so let us, let us look to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, convict us of where we have merely human concerns on our minds. And yeah, Lord, yeah, we think of those Christians across the world who um, are suffer and are persecuted. There's hundreds of millions of Christians, um, yeah, whether in North Korea or in Afghanistan or China or across this world, Lord, where be it, to be a Christian means to risk your life. Lord, let us pray for them, for their safety that they may recognize who Jesus is even in that situation through the power of your Holy Spirit Lord and Lord oh yeah I want to pray for our church that we would be a church of people who want to be Jesus's disciples who want to deny ourselves to deny our pride to take up our crosses and follow Jesus Lord that that is looking to those who are not like us those yeah, that it's seeking to value others above ourselves, that it's seeking to love Christ and to love others sacrificially, as you have loved us through the strength of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that that would be how these various ministries and church work, by the grace of, that is in Christ Jesus' death and resurrection. In our home groups, as we continue to read your word to see your salvation plan revealed to us, Lord, convict us um, but through our Holy, by your Holy Spirit so that we may have a hunger for your word. Lord, we pray that yeah, as we come to this uh, evangelical service next week where we look to the hope that is in Christ's resurrection, that the hope that one day Christ will return, that the Son of Man will come in power with his Father's, angel, Father's glory and the holy angels. Lord, that that is the hope we will set our hearts on, Lord. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will convict some people that Jesus' grace is for them and they would be adopted into sonship, into, this, into the family of the church that are brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray for a recovery for Della, for her eyesight, Lord. We pray that, yeah, and for her brain and the tumor on her brain, Lord, this is ongoing. And yeah, we, we don't understand it and we need to just, yeah, trust you even though we don't understand it. Lord, we pray for peace in the crisis in the Middle East, in uh, Jerusalem, Palestine, that it will not spiral, but yeah, um, yeah, there will be peace there, Lord. We pray for the students in Broadway Baptist and in Bristol, Lord, we pray, yeah, we thank you for the, some of them have been on reading weeks and may have been home. Lord, we pray for those that might be lonely, those students that feel the loneliness and those others in our city that feel the loneliness. That they would come to know Christ Jesus as their um, friend, as someone who they can always talk to, they can always rely on, Lord. Lord, we pray that, yeah, this would be through friendships and natural conversations that as your Holy Spirit goes out, the word is spoken about Jesus' death and resurrection. 
that he is, Jesus is coming back to this earth. Lord, we pray that will be the heartbeat of our Christmas events. That, yeah, we would not look to, for kind of consumerist Christmas, but for a sacrificial Christmas, seeing how, yeah, Jesus came in as the Lamb of God to die for our sins and came in humbly to this earth. He humbled himself. Despite being in very nature God, he humbled himself to this earth, Lord. So let us humble ourselves so that we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we go out to seek the lost, the hopeless and destitute. Lord, we see that on our doorstep here in Broadmead, those, whether it's people struggling with addiction or with homelessness, Lord. And we, we don't understand this suffering in this world. We don't understand why these people, why, why you, it's allowed. But Lord, we trust that you have a plan that you are good and you are holy. And we pray that you would reach some of these. We, yeah, I have these stories of the people who are rescued from addiction, they're rescued in the name of Jesus, Lord. Because that is where healing is to be found, Lord. Lord, we pray for peace in Eastern Europe and Russia and Ukraine, Lord. We pray that you would humble those leaders, that they may see that there is one rule of this world, and that is Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray for our international workers, Peter and Louise Lynch. And we pray that the Lord will support their work in the kingdom in Bangladesh, Lord. We pray that your kingdom would go out across this world. Lord, we think of, there are so many 7,000 or something unreached people groups of where there is no uh, church to reach them in their own community. They might not have your, the word in your, the, your holy scriptures, the Bible, in their language, Lord. Pray for the efforts of translation and pl church planting in those unreached people groups. And, yeah. And despite any persecution that comes in those groups, Lord, and those people that try and do your work, may you strengthen them by your Holy Spirit, that they may know that they are doing, uh, they're working for Christ Jesus, Lord. And we pray as John comes preach the word Lord open our hearts let your word be a sword that cuts through bone and sun in you and cuts to our hearts that convicts us of our sin and causes us to look to Jesus slain for us on the cross and risen again and one day coming back to earth because so let us know the love that is in Christ Jesus for us amen Lord, oh, yeah. And now let's pray the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Our Father. everyone. Our scripture is from Genesis chapter 50 verses 15 to 21. And it's on page 57 of the church's blue Bible. Looks like this. And it's also up on the screen. When Joseph's brothers saw <clears throat> that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to, jo to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Here is the scripture reading.
Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, as has been said, we're going through the Bible in two years, and we've got to um, the story of Joseph, and that started yesterday, um, and it'll be running for the next week or so. So this is a bit of a spoiler, I'm afraid, if you don't know the story already. Um, and it's an ancient story, and it's been told and retold for thousands of years, but it's still relevant today, and we're listening to it today. We're hearing it because it's got timeless truths that we need to hear, insights that will help us deal with adversity, um, overcome bitterness and rage, and that give us hope. But, but first up, let's, let's just recap the story. That is a, is a big old story, but it's a good story. Um, Joseph was born into a messy situation. His dad, Jacob, married two sisters, uh, Leah and Rachel. And Rachel was the love of his life, but couldn't have kids. Um, and Leah was unwanted, actually. Um, but she did have kids with Jacob. And that was a really dark and toxic story, basically, gets a whole lot messier than that. We're not going to go there. But eventually, Rachel, the love of Jacob's life, has a child herself. And that child is Joseph, who the story is about. And he's the first child of Jacob's favorite wife. And then Rachel dies giving birth to his brother. So you've got Joseph and Benjamin, the two children of Rachel. And Joseph is the favorite of Jacob, and Jacob is not subtle about it. He buys him this lovely coat, um, of many colors, um, and uh, he, he is also, Joseph, very good at dreams. Now, dreams in the ancient world were a bit like um, science now. If, if you kind of have a, a very clever and want a high-profile career that makes lots of money, you might go into science, you know, be a nuclear physicist or a rocket scientist or be an AI or something. Um, but back then, the way to do that was to be good at dreams, to be interpreting dreams. So it's kind of like a high-skilled job. And... Joseph has clearly got a gift for this. But his first dreams are all really about how he is much better than his brothers. <laughs> so he's already the favorite, and already they don't like him very much. And now he has these dreams. And they're different dreams, but they're basically complicated ways of saying, in the future, you're all going to bow down to me uh, because I'm better than you. Um, which obviously doesn't go down very well. His brothers hate him. Um, and this isn't like your normal brother hatred. Everyone who has a brother will say, I hate my brother, it's, it's the law. Um, but this is proper murderous stuff. They actually want to kill him. Um, they have evil intentions, and these intentions, they poison everything. They actually determine the whole course of Joseph's life. Um, and they get an opportunity when the parents aren't around, and they throw him down a well, and they're going to kill him. They are actually going to kill him. And the only reason they don't is because they have the opportunity to sell him into slavery instead, and they can make a bit of cash. Um, so they, they sell him into slavery, he goes to Egypt, and they tell their dad, Jacob, that his favorite son has been eaten by wild animals. And Jacob is absolutely distraught. It destroys him. It, it, the rest of his life, he's grieving. Okay, Joseph in Egypt now, and he's a slave, and that looks like a death sentence. Disaster, really. But he gets bought by a guy called Potiphar, who is one of Pharaoh's officials, and actually, that's a bit of a lifeline. Joseph makes a big success of being there. God is with him. He nails everything he does. He's just given responsibility for everything in Potiphar's life. And it seems to be going well. But then Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him, and she tries to have an affair with him. And Joseph repeatedly says no. And eventually, she's so insistent that she kind of grabs his clothes. And he's like, no, get off me. And she, she keeps on holding his clothes. And he, he, the only way he can get away from the situation is running away, leaving his clothes in her hands. So he's running around kind of naked. Or, or not very much. It's not clear how much he's got on. But she's left with his, his, his clothes. Uh, and she, she is furious. She really wanted him and she can't have him. And, and so she, she accuses him of rape. And he gets put in prison. And again, it's a disaster. It seems like another death sentence. But again, Joseph seems to make prison a success. Um, God is with him, again. He, he charms the jailer, who, who makes him responsible for everything in the prison, including all the other prisoners. Seems like a security nightmare, but it happened. Um, and it, he has complete trust there. And here, again, his, his skill with dreams comes into play. So there are two people there who were servants of the Pharaoh, the cupbearer and his baker, and they both have dreams. And Joseph interprets those dreams. He's very clear, though, that he says, I don't, I don't have much skill with dreams. It's God, who, it's God who has told me what's going on, what these dreams mean. Anyway, um, he predicts triumph for the cupbearer, 
and disaster for the baker. And within three days, both of those things come true. So Joseph is like, great, I've just saved someone who's going to the Pharaoh. He can get me out of prison. But it doesn't happen. He stays another two full years in prison. Um, and he thinks he's been forgotten. It's another disaster. But then there's an opportunity. Pharaoh has a set of dreams, and his cupbearer is like, oh, I know a guy who's, who's good at dreams. And all of his best dream people can't work out his dreams. Um, and so he, he gets Joseph. And Joseph has the same line he had before. I'm not amazing at dreams. It's God who, I'm, who is with me who, who has the answers. And basically, Pharaoh's dream is a prediction, a prediction of the future, that there will be seven years of famine, um, te- oh no, seven years of plenty, sorry, the other way around. Um, uh, loads of food will be produced by the land, and then there'll be seven years of famine. And Joseph doesn't just interpret the dream, he also has a, an amazing plan. He's like, why don't you build barns? Why don't you collect all the grain in the good years, and then in the bad years, you'll have enough to get you through. And Pharaoh really likes Joseph, as everyone seems to, apart from his brothers, um, and, and backs his idea and, and basically says, okay, great, do it. Uh, and gives him immense power, immense prestige. He becomes like the second most powerful person in Egypt, which is like the superpower of the day. So, that's a long story. Um, and we race through it. Basically, there's evil intentions, right? His brothers, they, they really want him to die. They hate him um, with every fiber in their being. They try and get rid of him. And through a series of like disasters and comebacks, Joseph ends up in a position of of great wealth and influence and, and power. Meanwhile, um, back in Canaan, there's a famine, the famine that Joseph predicted. Uh, and there's food in Egypt because of Joseph, and so they go to Egypt. And the brothers go, but Joseph's little brother, Benjamin, is not allowed to go. And he's not allowed to go because Jacob is still scarred about what happened to Joseph. He's terrified of Benjamin getting hurt. He's still grieving. And then they turn up, these brothers, and Joseph recognizes them. He's like, oh, it's you guys, the people who ruined my life. Um, And they don't recognize him. So he's got an opportunity to have a bit of fun with them. He interrogates them. He finds out his his dad and his brothers are alive. And he kind of sounds out, is there any remorse here? Do they regret what they did to me? Um, And... He, he hears them out. He lets them go. But as he lets them go, he says, you are not coming back unless you bring your little brother, Benjamin. A bit of a weird request. He says, I know you're spies, and the only way you can prove that what you're telling is true is if you bring your little brother back. So he sends them away. And he also puts, hides their own money in their sack of food. So they get back to Canaan, and they, they open their food, and they're like, oh, we've, the money's still here. What's going on? And they're terrified of going back to Egypt because they can't go back without Benjamin, and they've also, it looks like they've nicked the money. So, eventually, they have to go back because there's a famine. And when they turn up, Joseph, he, he basically treats Benjamin as a favorite. He does to Benjamin what his father does, did to him back in the day. He wants to see how the brothers respond to this kind of favoritism. Have they grown out of getting bitter about it? So he gives Benjamin the best food. He treats him the best. He, he kind of gives him special honor. And the brothers, they just sit there and they, they have to suck it up. But then when he sends them away, he hides his special cup in Benjamin's sack of food. So Benjamin, his little brother, is kind of sent on his way with this kind of trick. And Joseph sends men after the the, the brothers. And when they catch up with the brothers, he accuses them. He says, we get someone to say, you guys have have nicked my cup. It's in your bags. And of course, they haven't nicked the cup. They're like, no, we haven't. Search our bags. You won't find it. So when the bags are searched, of course, it does turn up. And it's in Benjamin's sack of food. And that's the kind of moment. Um, And Benjamin, obviously, is like, oh, no. What's dad going to say? And they're all like that because they know that dads, he's already grieving Joseph. So what happens next is what Joseph has done here is he's given his brothers the opportunity to throw Benjamin under the bus. 
like they did to him. He's, he's, he's set Benjamin up as the favorite, and now he's saying, look, you can get rid of him, no questions asked, easy job, I'll do it for you. But the brothers do a different thing this time. They are so strong in their defense of Benjamin, they just will not let him out of their sight. They go all the way back to Egypt with him, um, and they do that, and it's obvious that they've, they've changed. And they defend him so strongly that in the end, Joseph, he can't hold back anymore. He gets all emotional, and he like, makes a massive like, wailing, bah! and comes out, and everyone knows it's Joseph. And his brothers are obviously terrified because they've ruined his life. Um, but he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. He, he basically, Jacob then comes, he comes to Egypt, and the brothers... They are, they are, again, terrified of what Joseph is going to do. But again, his message is, you meant evil against me, God, but God meant it for good. And that's the message of the whole of Joseph. That's the landing point of Joseph. And it's really the landing point of the whole of Genesis, because Je- Joseph is the, is the final story in Genesis. That God meant it for good. Joseph could reasonably be expected to hate his brothers. They wanted to kill him. They deliberately ruined his life. They acted from bad motives, doing a bad thing. But God used their bad actions to bring about good. In hindsight, we can see that Joseph, being where he was, being who he was, meant that tens of hundreds, maybe, of thousands, millions, maybe, of lives were saved. And it wasn't just random lives. It was the lives of his family, the family of promise. If he hadn't gone, if his brothers hadn't done that, then that wouldn't have happened. Uh, But while it was happening, he hadn't got a clue. It's only when the music stops, only at the end of the story, only with that kind of vantage point, only with the benefit of hindsight can he see that. I love films with plot twists. I really, really like them. I love it when you get to the end of the film, and then there's five minutes of like, whoa, and then suddenly the whole film just completely changes. Have you got that? When you get to the end of a film and you have to rewatch the whole thing because it's all different because of the plot twist. And I, I've got a few examples, but I'm not going to say them because I don't want you to watch a film and know there's a plot twist. I can thought carefully about this, but I don't want to ruin any films for anyone. Um, but, oh, that hurt me, not saying that. Anyway, um, the, the, the power of a plot twist is that um, when you're viewing it for the first time, you are not in a position to understand what is actually going on. You just don't have the information. You cannot understand the story as it really is. And the characters in the film, before the plot twist happens, they cannot understand. They're literally not in a position. It's not possible for them to understand what is going on. And that is the situation Joseph was in for most of his life. And actually, that's the position that we are in for most of our lives. Stuff happens, we try and make sense of it, but fundamentally, we don't understand it all and we can't understand it all because we're not in a position to understand it all. So in the midst of it, Joseph was facing this cycle of, of a false door and a, a kind of followed by disaster and that went over and over again. He was the favorite kid, then the disaster of kidnap and slavery. He had this comeback at Potiphar's house, then the disaster of the rape accusation and and being in prison. Running the prison and then the hope of the dream, then he's forgotten again. It's a disaster. And finally, he solves the issue and runs the country, but then he's confronted by his brothers and this kind of emotional roller coaster. And all that comes from the malicious intentions of his brothers, but over it all, God was working, bringing things together for his glory and for Joseph's good. And we call this the sovereignty of God. That God is in control over events and that he's good. And we're reading through the whole of Genesis, which means we're looking at some pretty dark passages. I mean, today's passage is Genesis 38, which is kind of in, in between the Joseph story, and it's dark. It's hard stuff. And, and the Bible doesn't condone that darkness. It, it, it condemns it, often implicitly. But the story of Genesis as a whole is the story of Joseph. Yet we don't understand, we're not in a position to understand it all. But God uses what happens, everything that happens, for his purposes, and his purposes are good. 
And the story of Jesus is similar. Jesus was heralded by dreams, visions. Jesus came to save the world. He taught and he healed. And he announced this topsy-turvy kingdom where the last will be first and the first will be last that would grow from tiny beginnings like a seed into this mighty tree. A kingdom that was so precious that those in the know would sell everything they have to, to get a piece of it. A kingdom of the forgiveness of sins. A kingdom of authentic life with no time for hypocrisy. A kingdom of knowing God as Father, intimately. And that was the great hope of Jesus, but he experienced complete disaster. He was beset by the evil intentions of others, the bad intentions of, of people who, who set out to ruin his ministry. He was taken down by people who hated him. He was chronically misrepresented throughout his ministry. He was attacked by the authorities. He was sold by, by his, his friend, Judas. He was abandoned by his 12 closest disciples. He was turned on by the masses. He was tortured by the Roman army. He was convicted by the Jewish leadership. And then he was executed by the Roman government in the most brutal, degrading, dehumanizing way. An extended torture, his death was. But God meant it for good. It was this apparent disaster. But it was an actual a triumph. The cross, this instrument of torture, you see it there, is a symbol of Christian victory now. Jesus' death, it looked like a defeat of the kingdom he was announcing, but it was a victory. And Christianity is a religion that's based on the death 2,000 years ago of its leader. And have you, have you realized how weird that is? That's like a, an odd thing. Just as in Joseph, the apparent disaster and the evil intentions, there it's his brother's, that led to tens of hundreds, maybe millions of lives being saved. So here, in the life of Jesus, apparent disaster and evil intentions lead to millions of lives being saved. Acts 22, 23, um, Peter is delivering a sermon to the people who've just called for Jesus to die, and he said, this man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. See that combination? You did this. You're responsible. But this is part of God's plan. His foreknowledge. The cross ushered in the new kingdom. It looked like it was being destroyed. But in dying, in apparent defeat, the victim of an evil act done with the worst of intentions, Jesus achieved the best purposes of God. In dying, as an innocent man, Jesus took the guilt of the world. In suffering human injustice and divine justice, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. In succumbing to the power of evil, Jesus overcame and destroyed it. People wanted to take Jesus down. They had bad intentions and they succeeded. That's all true. But it was God's plan, and God saved the world through it. Through this apparent disaster, we can have freedom from guilt, forgiveness of sins. We can overcome evil. We can have life to the full now, life eternal in the future. We can live with the grain of reality. And that gives hope for the future. It gives us peace in the present. And we know that this worked because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. God took a despicable action and worked it for good. He is sovereign. But, and this is important, this wasn't obvious until the end. It looked really bad for Jesus, just like Joseph's story. From the wrong vantage point, until you get to the plot twist, you're not really in a position to judge what's going on in the story. The characters are, in it are clueless. The disciples as they watched Jesus crucified, would have been distraught. Uh, and Jesus himself suffered brutally in the process. <coughs> the greatest thing that ever happened looked like a disaster, even as it climaxed. So what does this mean then for us? 
Well, I don't know your story. I don't know what things you've experienced. Maybe you've been the victim of bad intentions. Maybe you're aware of what your own bad intentions have done. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've been, maybe you've been the victim of, of horrendous ill fortune, bad luck. Maybe you're angry with God. Maybe you're so angry you don't believe in him. Maybe everything's fine. I don't know. Life's confusing, isn't it? It's a jumble. Our intentions are good and bad. Some are achieved. Some are achievable. Some are unachieved. Some are unachievable. But so often we don't meet our own intentions. But it's important that we hear this morning that God has good intentions. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purposes. That doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean there aren't struggles. But it does mean that we know when the music stops, when we get to the end of the film, when we have the vantage point, when we're in the position to know that we will understand the deep, deep goodness of God. The world is chaotic, it is messy, it's confusing, it's painful. But we are called to respond in trust. And God working this good is based in Jesus Christ. The ultimate expression of God's sovereignty it is the cross. The evil act, the apparent defeat that was actually the plan of God and the victory of Jesus. And for Joseph, this meant trust. He'd been given this promise right at the start of his story in the form of a dream, right? Everyone's going to bow down to you. Bit of an egotistical dream, maybe. But, you know, it was, it was a promise from God. And all that kind of l- long, long period when he was screwed by the bad intentions of his brothers in the well, in slavery, falsely accused, in prison for years and years. He was able to trust. He did trust. And he needed to trust. And that trust gave him strength. Did it mean that every situation went well? No. No, it didn't. Did God come through in the end? Yes. And for you, maybe in this life, you may follow Jesus and uh, live with a grain of existence. It works. Actually, the Bible tells us the, be- the best way of living. It's wise. It, it, good principles for life. And you may have the experience of Joseph. Uh, you may get to the end of your life and you may look back and say, I can see how it all worked out. Yes, there was some gnarly moments, but I can see God worked it for good. So praise God, that happened. But it may only come the other side of the grave. You can live the right way. You can believe the truth. You can love who you are called to love. And you can be led through unbearable suffering, through grief, through deep pain. That was the experience of Jesus. And his triumph through pain and sorrow, in the midst of pain and sorrow, it sheds light and it offers hope in our afflictions here and now. So it doesn't mean that every situation will go how we want. Of course not. It might, mean, it might not mean that the contours of life, the whole broad sweep of things, it, you might be profoundly unsatisfied with that. But it is the best way to live. And God will come through in the end. And we are called to trust, to join in, to say yes, to participate, to respond. I don't know know where you are now. It might feel like you're down the middle of a a well with no water. It might feel like you're you're a slave to something. It might feel like you're in prison. It might feel like you're falsely accused. I don't know. 
It might feel like you've got pressure to do something you know is wrong. Someone enticing you. Come on, let's do it. Maybe you feel forgotten. But trusting in God in the midst of that gives us strength. It gives us hope. And we know that God, in the end, will put it right. This also gives us power to overcome bitterness. We could expect Joseph to be consumed by rage. He's, the naked hatred of brothers has, his, has ruined his life. He was wrong. But seeing the bigger picture, seeing God at work through what happened, empowered him to forgive. Trusting it before the end, before he could see it all, gave him the capacity to work forward, to not let the past to dominate him, to forgive. Now, we are not at the end. We can't see how God is going to use everything. Most of us are not going to get to the end of our lives and be the second most powerful person in the world and be like, oh yeah, I can see how it will happen. We might just be in the position of seeing someone we love or, or hate or, or tolerate or maybe all of those things ruining our lives or ruining the lives of people that we care about. God is sovereign. In Christ, we know there will be justice in the future. In Christ, we can see that God does bring good from evil, even when it looks like it's ended darkly. In Christ, we can know that even the darkest ending is endurable because of the life beyond life that he won. We know right will be done, the good will be restored. That doesn't mean we don't work for justice now, we're called to act. But it does empower us to be free from the ruin of bitterness. We can trust God. There will be justice. Wrongs will be righted. And Jesus suffered the worst to redeem us from evil. Bad intentions, the bad actions of others and of ourselves are not the final word. The final word is Christ. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that we would be given the grace of, of being able to trust in you. Lord, teach us to trust when it's hard. Teach us to trust when it's easy. And Father, we pray that you'd give us the power to overcome bitterness. Thank you so much that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And that in him there is hope. We pray that in his name. Amen. Yeah, we're going to celebrate communion together now. Um, and communion is a celebration of our union with Christ. Um, and through him, with each other. Bread and wine are formed through the destruction of grain and grapes. Grain is ground down to flour. Grapes are crushed into wine. Christ was ground down. Christ was crushed. He experienced that so we could be united to him now and through him with each other. That's what we remember with this little meal and that's what we celebrate. Eating and drinking is wonderful and it's also necessary. Without food and drink, we die. They're life. And without food and drink, life is impoverished. They bring joy. The bread and the wine show what Christ is for us. Christ is wonderful and he is necessary. Without Christ we die. He is our life together. And without Christ life is impoverished. He is our joy and our love. That's what we remember and celebrate now together. And this physical act of drinking bread and drinking, uh, eating bread and drinking wine, sorry, is a clear, simple presentation of what we believe. That Christ was broken for our wrongdoing and that life flows from his brokenness if we accept it and feed on it in our hearts. So come to this table, not because you must, but because you may, not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come, not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Now, if you don't believe this, if you're not following Christ, then we're really glad you're here. It's great you're here. Um, but the bread and wine aren't for you, so we'd ask you to pass, pass them on as they come around. And we're going to pray now. 
We do not presume to come to this, your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our simple bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and hear us. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And do eat the bread as it comes round, that we passed round. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it. died my soul to save my lips shall still be clean in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes we drink the juice together to symbolize our unity, so hold on to it until everyone has one, and then we'll drink it together. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Raise this life. 
Let's drink together. I'll just pray and then we'll carry on. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection, and his future return. Please help us to remember, love, and obey him this week as we wait for his glorious appearing. We pray this in his name. Amen. Great. We're going to uh, we're going to sing one final song together, um, and it just links into what to what John was saying that um, in Christ alone our hope is found. Um, and as we sing this, um, just an invitation: the the prayer team are going to be at the back over there. Um, just recap some of the things that that John said. We we'd love to give you the opportunity to pray with someone, um, particularly as we focus in on the I suppose our our role in that story where we are. Um, and invite you to, to go and uh, pray with someone if maybe this morning you want to know the, the deep goodness of God's love more. Or, or maybe uh, as you reflect on where you are right now, maybe you feel a little bit like Joseph and you feel down and well, trapped, forgotten. Uh, we want to invite you to pray with someone that you might know the deep love of God in that situation. Uh, the, the love of God and, and know his eternal plan for you as well. Um, in that. So we're going to sing in Christ alone. Um, and yeah, just encouragement is to make this your, your prayer, uh, that we would have trust in God's plan and his sovereignty over our lives. Um, and despite the situations that we're going through, we would know a deep sense of peace and joy because of all that he's done for us. So why don't we stand and let's sing in Christ alone together. alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, for by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I lay. body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. Fresh 
precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. The power of hell. No power of hell, no scheme of man. or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand Amen, Amen That's the, uh, that's the end of our, our time together this morning and as we uh, as we go, let me just read um, that verse from Romans that, that John read to us earlier. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, please do stick around. Um, the prayer team are going to be at the back over there. Um, we'd love to pray with you uh, or pray with the person uh, you came with as well. Uh, we're just going to play in the background now. But yeah, have a great week and have an amazing Sunday.